ask a question that every marketer must ask themselves every time they ask anyone to do anything. If I am, <laughs> that parenthetical means whatever you put in that blank, let's say the ideal customer, why should I take this action rather than these other actions? This question has lots of applications, but I'm going to focus for the most of this course now, especially until the final session on its commercial application, because it's going to build your value proposition in the workplace. It's going to impact your career and make you more valuable as you know what it is and how to use it. So let's begin with a breakdown of the statement. The first question is, if I. Now, the reason that's so important is it changes something dramatically. It's a complete and opposite shift. I'm going to explain to you what I mean. Ken, you're the customer, yes. okay? And I'm the marketer. The first thing that formulation requires me to do is not answer in the form of, what would Ken want? But I have to do this, if I can get you to stand up. If I, I have to come over here and get in, Ken, get in Ken's seat. <laughs> it feels good, I'm going to stay here for a little while. <laughs> I, I have to get in Ken's seat because I have to get in his shoes, in his place. Now let's go back. Let's apply it to my presentation. I just used the value proposition with you two minutes ago. I'm asking for something, your attention, in the last few minutes, knowing that you're probably tired and uh, I've been where you're at. And sometimes it's hard to concentrate after a long session. So what did I offer you in exchange for it? something that would help your career. Remember what we said? And will help build your own value proposition. What am I doing? I'm getting inside of, I'm trying to get out of my skin into Ken's skin and get him to, you know, once I'm in his skin, I start to feel what he needs to hear from me because I'm trying to buy 10 more minutes of his attention. And I don't say that in any manipulative way. It's honest. What I said, I truly meant. And what it can do for you, it truly can. I've seen this. But if you're not careful, I just shove this content down your throat, and that doesn't work. It only, hurts. it only works if you receive it. It's like sort of turning over soil before you plant. You have to turn it over and get it fresh, and then when you plant, you get a harvest. So that if I is exactly that process. Every single person that asks this question has to get out of their skin and into the skin, out of their place and into the place of the other person. And this is the hardest thing for any human being to do. This is where our blind spot come from. And, and so the first move is a profound move and easily to miss, but we're moving from third person to first person. I've seen marketers sit around the table and talk in the third person and they never get it right. You know, I, I use the word never in a general sense. Until you can feel, until you can feel what it's like to be the other person, you don't get the copyright. All right, so if I am your ideal prospect, wow, this is important. Because one of the reasons we fail is we don't focus. We try to be everything to everyone, and you can't be everything to everyone, and you won't beat a competitor doing that because the competitor or the company that focuses on the people they can serve the best will produce the best result. Labs, this course is not for everyone. It might help everyone, but everybody's not ready for it. Everybody's not going to, you know, uh, give it their attention or the time in their life. I know that if we were marketing this course, we're not going to market to the whole world. First of all, even though it might have application to other areas in life, you're probably not going to take this course in the beginning if you're not a marketer or somehow involved in marketing because you don't even know about the other things. You don't learn that till after you sign up. So one of the most important things a marketer has to ask, and this is where we start to intensify the value that we can deliver, is who can I serve the best? And we don't do that. We, we're sort of general about it, but let me take it to writing. The only way to be an effective writer is to truly understand who your reader is and to ask which kind of reader can I serve the best and then concentrate on improving that. The writer who doesn't do that will never have the impact of the writer who does.
And when I write, I often take three or four profiles and even pictures of the kind of person I'm trying to reach, and I'll put them on the desk in front of me, and I look at them. And to take this one step further, the reason you're here today as I teach this, instead of me speaking to a studio camera for 12 sessions, is because I need to see you and feel you to draw out of me what we need to deliver to the thousands of other people who will take this course. It's the same thing. You're helping me get out of my skin and into yours. Does that make sense? You're just like those pictures I put on my desk, except far more interesting and three-dimensional. All right? Except for Ken. He's a cartoon. All right, so, by the way, when you're a leader, one of your most important jobs is to help your team say no to all the other profiles so they can say yes to the profile you serve the best. You can't sell everything and you can't sell it to everybody. And sometimes we don't have the discipline at the top of our organization to make those hard choices. And the more authority you have, the more you need to exercise it to make it easier for your people to do their best job. Let me move on. A value proposition is an ultimate reason. I want you to notice that it says why. Frankly, a value proposition and sometimes we have a negative connotation for this word. It's an argument, but I mean it in the way academics create an argument or scientists create a proposition and a set of arguments. It is the argument from the company's perspective for why you should be their customer. And the argument may have several propositions, but when you put them all together and summarize them, they become the ultimate reason. That's what a value proposition truly is. Now, as I'm giving you this definition, I want you to understand something. Academics, and this is part of my other world, academics argue and quibble about definitions sometimes for thousands of years. I mean, Aristotle was one of the first to talk about the importance of a definition to signal what he calls essence. Very good. It's a beautiful passage in Greek, and he's right. And he, he identified how hard it is to give something a name. He sees that a name and a definition come closely together and help you understand essence. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that because the definition of a value proposition, which is more like a framework for us, is not being judged in terms of its effectiveness by whether or not a group of academics compromise. Someone said a camel is a horse put together by a committee. I don't want a camel. So what is the way we determine if this framework is right? I'll tell you the way. It's functionality. How well does it help me get to the desired outcome? That's the standard that we weigh against it. And every single person who takes this course has an opportunity to help us improve that functionality and that definition. But we're giving you something that we have tested and seems to be the best way to epitomize what we've learned. Does that make sense for all of you? There is no exact answer to that question. I mean, somebody else could say, well, I mean a value proposition point two, or I mean a value proposition and they capitalize three letters. You know, you, anybody can win if you define the words, right? I can say that he's wearing a red shirt, and you can say that's not red. And I can say, oh, yes, it is. This is what I call red, and show me that color. Who says that R-E-D stands for that color? Nobody but the guys who frame the English language. And there isn't, you know, the problem is if you use a different definition than I do, when I say red and you say red, we get two different things. And that's happening all day long when it comes to value propositions. So you have to choose as an organization what you mean, and you should choose that which is most effective for you. And that's how we arrived at this. And it leads me to this next point. The way we understand a value proposition is that it's not a slogan at the top of your page underneath your logo. It's not a description of your business. I've seen people use that. It's not your unique selling proposition. It involves it. It includes it. It's part of your reason, but it's not the whole reason. You follow me? It is the ultimate reason why a customer should buy from you. Now, having said that, 
A value proposition must differentiate you from your competitors in at least one way. You have to have an only factor. Let me explain to you why. If you sell a product that's just as good as the product you sell, that's just as good as the project that Regina sells, so Kayla, Wayne, and Regina, all three sell a product, three different products, but they're just as good as each other. Why should I buy from Wayne instead of Kayla? If all three of you are selling a product that is the same in its overall effectiveness, the only way one of you is going to win is if you figure out a way to innovate. Remember Drucker? You got to innovate a better product. And or, and often a part of innovation, is you need to focus on a segment you can serve better. Meaning that if all three of you are marketing to an audience this big, and each of you are sharing a percentage of market share, you know, where you have a, among your companies, if one of you says, we're going to focus on accountants only, you can now be dominant in that particular niche. And if that niche is big enough, you may build a healthier company, even if you're number three, than number two. Because you focused on the ideal customer. Every organization needs to figure out, first of all, the customer set they can serve the best. Then they continue to innovate value into that equation until they're continually delivering the best service. And by the way, do you see how this definition keeps us from being hypesters and hucksters? Because you don't win in this game by yelling louder or lying. You can lie, but the minute they feel your value proposition's truth, you're done. And eventually, guess what it does? We'll learn this later. Kills your brand. Kills your brand. Because the experience of your value proposition becomes disappointing. And eventually that will catch up. The beautiful thing about this framework is it forces an integrity between the claim and the reality. And it focuses the attention of the company not on how persuasive their words can be, but how right their value can be. When you get this right, your biggest problem is not going to be talking people into anything. It's going to be communicating clearly what you have. Clarity trumps persuasion. Clarity trumps persuasion. Clarity trumps persuasion. And I got news for you. You may feel deep down inside that you don't have those magical words that you've heard copywriters have and you wish you could have them, you know, that power to persuade somebody to do anything. I've heard people say, that guy's amazing. He can sell ice to an Eskimo. You know what I think? Only once. You won't sell it a second time. That's nonsense. You don't need to be persuasive. You need to be clear. And frankly, it's very hard to be clear. Remember the Mustang ad? Was it very clear? No. And if you'll just look around tonight when you walk out the door at billboards as you ride home, and any time you encounter an offer, you're going to find something. The number one problem with the stuff we look at is it's not clear. And there's no reason why anyone in this room can't learn to be clear. That's obtainable by everyone. You don't need to have the magic birthright of the expert copywriter. You need to find value and represent it clearly.